the great protein debate with Dr. Neil Bernard and Dr. Matthew Niagara. I saw this on Forks Over Knives' YouTube page. Do vegans really need to worry about protein? Some plant-based experts say that you don't even need to think about it, and others argue it's just not that simple. Matt mentioned something else that is really so important. There's so much we can get into. Welcome to the great protein debate. Everyone, this is Klaus from Plant Based News. I'm with Shabnam and Sarah. What's going on? Hi, how's it going? Really, really good. Today, we're going to be going through a really interesting video, which is on Fox Over Knives' YouTube page about protein. How much do you need, where to get it, and what the evidence actually shows? This is what we're going to unpack. So, let's get into it. There's so much we can get into amino you know, acid profiles, bioavailability. Maybe we'll get deeper into that as the time goes on here. But on a service level, if any of those subtle differences in amino acid profiles or bioavailability mattered, we should see that borne out in clinical trials where one group is given plant protein and one group is given animal protein. And we now have two trials comparing either a completely plant based or almost completely plant based diet versus an omnivorous diet where both groups consume a sufficient amount of protein, generally above 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight. So that's about double of the RDA, which is often recommended for strength athletes. And in that case, where both groups consume the same amount of protein and they lift weights, they get the same results. It doesn't matter whether it came from plants or animals. So we can get bogged down into these debates over, oh, do you absorb, you know, five more percent of this or that, or does it have more leucine or less? But at the end of the day, does it actually pan out when we look at the trials? No, both work. And so it doesn't really matter whether you're getting plant or animals. Matthew Nagra is really becoming a great representative of plant-based nutrition specifically around protein. It's really great to see. He's very just succinct. He just tells it how it is, but uses the data like Shab and as you always say, we've got to come back to what trials have actually been done, what the proof is, and he always just falls back on that. So I love that. Yeah, he's heavily evidence-based. It's the evidence that leads him towards the decisions and the lifestyle factors that he follows. Much like Dr. Neil Bonar, I think he does that in a very smart, strategic, evidence-based way. Matt mentioned something else that is really so important. When people have looked at mortality, let me give you some of these figures. I think it was 2016 at Harvard, Dr. Mingyang Song, who's a wonderful researcher, he spoke at our ICNM last year. Let's say I'm eating animal protein and I switch to getting my protein from plants, just the protein switch alone. If I'm getting rid of eggs and having uh, plant protein instead, 19% drop in the overall mortality. It's the nurse's health study, the health professional's follow-up study, you combine them all together. Poultry, everybody's thought, oh, isn't that the healthiest thing? If you dump the poultry down the garbage disposal and substitute plant protein, total mortality drops 6%. Fish, wait a minute, isn't that the healthy one? Dump the fish, substitute plant protein, mortality drops another 6%. Dairy protein, dump it eat instead, have plant protein, mortality goes down 8%. So in every single category, the plant proteins are associated with better mortality stats. There's no reason in 2025 to get your protein from an animal. I love that. Most vegan proponents or plant-based nutritionists and lifestyle medicine doctors agree that animal protein is really bad. Um, even massive dietary guidelines do as well. Within the plant-based community, I think there's a divergence of opinions when it comes to just how much plant-based protein you need. There are lots of the kind of old school plant-based doctors like Dr. Neil Bernard, Dr. McDougall, that are basically just eat plants and do not worry about protein. There's this new wave of plant-based doctors that are taking more of an approach whereby if you train as a plant-based athlete, you need way more protein-rich kind of foods. We'd love to know what you think, Shabnam. Protein does matter. People that are more physically active and have more physically active demanding jobs, say construction, they need to be eating more protein in their day. Absolutely. The review of multiple meta-analyses is now showing in terms of enhancing athletic performance, no matter the age, consuming around 1.6 grams of protein per kilo body weight is showing greater impacts for better athletic performance. And that's because you have a stronger amino acid pool to pull from during activity and post-activity. Basically, how we see that is the more free-flowing amino acids you have in your blood, the less you break down muscle to obtain that amino acid profile for muscular repair, right? Or whatever you need. I think what you guys are, are talking about is actually about to be talked about in the next clip where they talk about actually how much protein do we need? The bottom line sort of thumbnail that people have used is a reasonable thing for everyday people. If you just put the numbers together, it works out to be roughly 50 grams of protein. For an average sized woman, it would be 46 grams. For an average sized man, it'd be 56 grams. But who's average? Some people are more, some people are lower. And I honestly don't think your average person needs to calculate that any more than they need to calculate how much oxygen do you need. 
Do you need oxygen? Absolutely. How much oxygen is there in the air you breathe? The answer is 21%. Who knew that? People don't know that. Then they don't need to know that because your body is designed to extract the oxygen, leave out the nitrogen. Your body does it automatically. And let's say you're more physically active. You will need more protein, but you're going to be taking in that protein pretty much naturally because your increased activity will fuel uh, an increased appetite. Now, some people will decide, wait, I'm going to be purposeful because I'm specifically trying to, to build muscle mass. And there people can make different calculations and I'll let Matt talk about that. Um, well, for starters, I, I think I would actually aim higher than the 0 0.8 grams per kilogram, which is what led to that 50 number. You know, if we look at different guidelines around the world, uh, we see that in places like Germany, Australia, Nordic countries, they actually recommend higher intakes, particularly as we age, about one point zero grams per kilogram. We can get into why that is, but just to showcase that it's not consistent across the world. There are some variations there. And that's largely because our ability to utilize protein declines as we age. Our bone health typically suffers and protein may play a role there. We see that this guideline of 0 0.8 grams per kilogram was based largely around what's called nitrogen balance, essentially measuring how much protein do you take in versus how much do you lose? And is it equivalent? But since when is that the ideal, right? With, with calcium, we don't want to take in just as much as we're losing. We want to take in more than we're using. And we can apply the same to protein. And, and when we look at clinical outcomes, like out of the Nurses Health Study and Health Professionals follow-up study, a recent publication by Andrea Glenn and colleagues found that plant-based protein certainly superior to animal protein, but particularly beneficial in the context of a high-protein diet. So it was aiming higher with protein and focusing on more plants that was beneficial. Again, recommendations will vary a little bit. They're generally at least one gram per kilogram long-term, which is about 25% higher than the RDA. So not a huge increase, but a little bit. And then for strength athletes looking to maximize their gains, it's about 1.5 to 1.6 grams per kilogram uh, of body weight where there's no further benefit. So for a 70 kilogram individual, about 150 pounds, aiming for say that 1.6 grams per kilogram, double the RDA, that's 116 grams of protein. And yes, you know, if you're an athlete and you're very active, you're going to be consuming more calories overall, but you're probably not doubling your calorie intake. And so that's where I think focusing a little bit more on um, high protein plant foods there can go a long way with helping you hit those targets versus just, you know, focusing on the, the rice and the veggies and the fruits to try to hit those numbers. Yeah. So basically exactly what you just said. <laughs> What about where people say, yeah, but like to get the same amount of protein from plants, I need to eat like so much more. Is it more just about having a variety of different plant sources? If I said you're only going to eat broccoli at this setting at lunch to get your protein impetus, I mean, what are you going to do? A chicken breast is approximately anywhere between 23 to 26 grams of protein. But if I eat a cup of broccoli with mixed beans and some brown rice and some sauce, now I'm talking about a meal that could have an excess of 40 grams of protein. And so, yeah, I think later on they touch on similar kind of topics where they talk about mixing, matching different plant foods. Actually, it's funny because people tend to mean very different things every time they use the term incomplete. So the sort of classic uh, definition of an incomplete protein that I've heard is that plants are completely missing one of the nine essential amino acids, and that is plain false. All plants contain all nine essential amino acids. Christopher Gardner and, and colleagues wrote a great paper covering this as well. Um, and so that is not necessarily a worry. In fact, the only food really that I'm, I'm or food product, food-like product that I can think of that is completely missing one of the nine essential amino acids is collagen or, or its derivative gelatin, which is an animal product and it's missing the amino acid tryptophan. So it's kind of ironic uh, given that it's more of the animal-based proponents that tend to make that claim. Now, something else that people might mean when they say incomplete protein is that because plants with a few exceptions like soy tend to have varying amounts of amino acids, like beans tend to be lower in the amino acid methionine, grains tend to be a bit lower in the amino acid lysine, that if you were to only eat that food and barely meet your minimum recommendation uh, for protein intake, you might end up with too little of a certain amino acid. But in practice, that just doesn't really matter because I think all three of us here would agree that we should eat more than one food. And as long as you're eating a somewhat of a variety throughout your day, you're having some grains, you're having some legumes, you're having some nuts, you're having, you know, uh, the fruits and veggies on top of that. If you're having some variety, they will complement each other. There's no need to hyper-focus on combining foods at every single meal. Your breakfast will combine with your lunch, will combine with your dinner, and then we're also recycling our own proteins and muscles and, and, and tissues and whatnot all the time as well. So they will mix and match just fine. Uh, it's a matter of getting enough of the protein and having some level of variety. Oh, I love him so much. Isn't he wonderful? He's so good. 
many people may feel, oh my God, I can't think about constantly creating a new grain bowl here or here. I think he's saying if you comprehensively get some variety throughout your day, you can get high levels of amino acids from a variety of plant-based foods. You are going to hit your diversity in foods. I think I find that a bit more reassuring to be like, I can make it up at the next meal. I also like the idea that there is one food that is an incomplete amino acid profile and it's not even a plant food it's collagen which is an animal derived food so i'm like ha. the topic of soy of course came up in this conversation let's tackle this one head on yeah so uh the concerns arise from the fact that uh soy contains these isoflavones these flavonoid compounds that are often called phytoestrogens and this is because they have certain structural characteristics that are similar to estrogen and because of that they can interact with estrogen receptors in our body now people take that to mean that hey these phytoestrogens therefore have estrogenic effects and it's not that simple for one they preferentially bind to certain types of receptors in our body that have different effects in different parts of the body in bone tissue they have pro estrogenic effects, which is a good thing. That actually helps lay down more bone density and prevent uh, removal of some of that bone tissue. Now, in breast tissue, they have anti-estrogenic effects. So they actually do the opposite of what estrogen would. And that is one of the reasons why in the long-term uh, cohort studies that we see where people are actually consuming soy products daily or almost daily versus those who are occasionally or never consuming soy, we see a reduction in breast cancer risk. So if anything, soy is protected. And this is recognized by the American Cancer Society, by the Canadian Cancer Society. Um, and uh, one of them, I can't remember which one, also makes a note stating that in people who have previously been diagnosed with breast cancer, it can also be beneficial there. Again, he really knows his stuff, right? What's more of a thing in terms of anti-vegan argument? Soy gives you man boobs and estrogen, or you can't get protein on a plant-based diet. I think about 50-50, right? They're on par, I'd say. I just wonder when people are going to get this idea that soy does not cause cancer. It can actually prevent cancer. Like, I think you delivered it so well, but I just feel like it feels like a broken record. That's all I hear. Like you said, Klaus, soy boy man boobs it's gonna turn you into a woman like all of this stuff it's just completely false yeah it's the opposite of the truth plant protein is so much healthier same with soy phytoestrogens actually decrease the risk of breast cancer and yet advocates of animal-based diets act as if it increases cancer rate do you know when something's so insane it's like you just don't know how to respond <laughs> yeah Dr. Barnard, I, I can't say some of this stuff. I'm going to let you say it because I know that you're passionate about this. Some of the recommendations from some of the leading anti-cancer organizations in the world, their dietary recommendations include animal-based products. I don't understand why this might be happening. And I just wanted to see your thoughts because we're sitting here talking about a lot of this stuff. And we understand that the link between soy and breast cancer, I mean, this, this was just explained by Dr. Nagra. So am I on to something in the sense that Maybe there's another reason why they might recommend the, the opposite of the foods that we're talking about. Like help me navigate some of these thoughts because I know people are confused. You're right in the sense that money has goofed things up a little bit. Commercialism is, is, not, the, is not really our friend necessarily. Their whole idea was let's, let's uh, sell breast cancer drugs. But I got to tell you, things are changing. Things are changing dramatically. And every major cancer organization knows that soy products do not cause cancer. They know that soy products reduce the risk of cancer. Exactly what Matt said. It, and we have many studies now, uh, big studies where women consuming the most soy have the least risk of developing breast cancer, about a 30% drop overall, or maybe even more, depending on the cohort. Their male spouses or friends also have reduced cancer risk. So it helps both. And uh, with regard to women who have been previously diagnosed with breast cancer, those who consume the most soy, it will reduce their risk of a recurrence and reduce the risk of mortality by about roughly 25 30%. Now, there's a lot of variability, but soy does not cause cancer. And if a person gets a cancer diagnosis, you want to go to the store and buy healthy foods. And that means vegetables and fruits, brightly colored things with their anthocyanins and antioxidants, and make sure soy is in the cart. If you want to see the entirety of that conversation between Dr. Matthew Nagra and Dr. Neil Bernard, we'll link Forks Over Knives' YouTube channel down below. As ever, thank you so much for watching this. Peace out.